It's that annoying part of winter that feels like it has been winter forever. Wandering down a freshly paved road on the new side of town, streetlights glowing halogen green and chain restaurants all around you, you feel trapped in today. Then suddenly you stumble upon a path out of the corner of your eye. In some deep part of you, you can tell that this is an ancient path. It leads you to a sign lit by torchlight that says, Anselm Society Digital Pub. Wandering inside, you encounter a scene that does not exist in today's world. People laughing and discussing art's relationship to faith and faith's relationship to art. You find a table in the corner, right by the fire, and with two particularly cool guys sitting at it. One with the big bushy beard, one who has just recently shaved his mustache to look like Wesley from The Princess Bride. This is the Believe to See table at the Ants of Society Digital Pub. <laughs> and welcome to Believe to See. I'm one of your co-hosts, Matt Milma, joined here as always by Marcus Robinson. Marcus, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing good. Just to clarify, I am not the one who uh, recently trimmed my mustache to look like Wesley from The Princess Bride. So I did, and I will explain why right now. Uh, I have recently had some time off of work, been on uh, been on leave because uh, our third child was born, taking care of him. Things are going great, thank you for asking. And since I wasn't in, in the office, I was like, hey, let's get a little bit more daring with my facial hair. I've always thought that uh, Carrie Elwes' mustache in Princess Bride was cool, so I got a picture of it off the internet and shaved it to look like it. I friggin' love the thing. I kept looking <laughs> at my reflection in the mirror. Danielle allowed me to have it for two days, that which is very gracious. Longer over. than she had to, and I'll probably yeah. never have it back. It's probably true. We'll see. I'll go for it tomorrow. I'll let y'all know how it goes. Oh, but anyway, no. but anyway, this is the Believe to See podcast, and our guest today is a friend of the show. He has uh, visited the pub table before, and we're happy to have him back. It is Blake Hartung. Blake, how are you doing? Doing well. I have tried to mustache usually for about a couple minutes when I'm shaving, and I go, "Okay, no." <laughs> it's, it, I, I know, I know when to fold, and yeah, now I'll I, stick with a beard. I, I a beard think, or nothing is kind of my perspective. Oh, really? So I think one of my problems is my father-in-law has had a mustache forever. He's just one of those mustache guys. He's always oh, had wow. a mustache. So I think that has soured my wife to having. To letting me have a mustache too. Yeah, that makes some sense. Now, Blake, have yeah, you Yeah, that's true. I sort of associate it with the older generation, the, the baby boomers and <laughs> and above. And so I think that's part of the reason why I look at it and I go, hmm. I guess the next generation is going to say that about beards. Oh, my dad has a beard. I don't want a beard. Well, I look back to like my dad's uh, college yearbook. <laughs> Him and all of his friends either had a mustache or tried to have a mustache. <laughs> so, so, Marcus, we, we've established on the podcast before you, you had a mullet. Oh, this, yeah. is, this is when mullets were cool, so no judgment, listeners. That's right. I'm guessing you missed the mustache boob, did you? Or did oh, you no, have I had a mustache. I had mustache, a mustache and mullet. Time. Yeah, yeah. It was, wow. it was very bad. <clears throat> I've had stunning. everything. I've had the goatee. I've had the soul patch. <laughs> I'm just, I'm down with the bushy beard. You, it's you, working for you. You decided to, with the menu, you got all of the above. I've tried them all, you've, yeah. You've stuck with. I've stuck with it. Okay. Let's just, yeah, this is a good thing for my chin. Well, I'll give my own little, I'm sorry, I know probably about half of our listeners are women, so I apologize, but I finally they, found... They cannot relate to at all to this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just, I just, I really love my Wesley mustache. Danielle, if you're listening, give it one more chance. One more chance. Don't. No. Danielle, don't give in. You're, you're rescuing him from regret on those pictures. But... The reason Blake has joined the table today is because <laughs> Not last time, after Blake was here last time, the popularity of Ephraim just went <laughs> through the roof, people. So Blake is back here just to follow up and to talk more about Ephraim and, you know, how he started. He's the chart topper. So to, not it? to try to ground Marcus's statement in a little bit more. Oh, okay. Uh, so Blake, <laughs> Blake joined us in the last time to talk about a St. Ephraim the Syrian who was... You really? know, uh, you all know Saint Ephraim. This Syrian. everybody, yeah, every listener knows. <laughs> so he was a really fascinating. Uh, he's considered the greatest uh, hymnographer in the early That's church, right. and really interesting. Blake did his uh, doctoral work on him, so we we're talking about him in particular. But this time, I thought we could talk a little bit more generally about ancient literature uh, and maybe the value of reading ancient works. Uh, some good works for us to get going on. 
And as we were sort of bouncing this idea around, Blake uh, gave the idea of the, the launch point, and that was C.S. Lewis, as, as is usual with the Insel Society. So, Blake, tell us why you think C.S. Lewis has to add to our, our pub table conversation today. I would say about, so I guess it was probably about 10 years ago that when I was reading Athanasius of Alexandria on the Incarnation, a really fantastic, pivotal work of early Christian theology from the 4th century. Mm-hmm. And there is an English translation of it, which every every listener can get from popular patristics uh, series put out by St. Vladimir's Seminary Press in paperback for like $12. And in this uh, translation of On the Incarnation, there is a, a reprint of a preface by C.S. Lewis, mm-hmm. which surprised me when I first encountered this. I, I was like, huh, C.S. Lewis, <laughs> you know, he just turns up in unexpected places, you know? It's sort of I like running ex- into your teacher at, at like the grocery store when you're a kid. It's like, oh, you're, you're here too. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, it just, I didn't expect to find C.S. Lewis here. And as I read that preface, I was just struck by the insight that Lewis had about not only, you know, not only just about Athanasius, because he's, he's not an Athanasius scholar, mm-hmm. really. I mean, but about just the benefit of reading old books. I felt that Lewis articulated that, of course, better than I ever had before, because he just had a gift for, you know, bringing ideas and concepts like that to life in, in ways that are that are vibrant and accessible, even, you know, 70, 80 years after he initially wrote uh, a lot of these things. So, you know, Lewis makes an argument that, like, you know, we tend to avoid um, old books because we feel most of us, especially, you know, those of us who are kind of lifelong learners, we feel like that we're not qualified to understand them, that they have to be left to the experts. And, you know, instead I need to read. So the exa- one example he gives is that, you know, I as a student, you know, feel that I need to read a book about Plato so that I can better understand yep. you know, right. Plato instead of just picking up one of the dialogues and and actually encountering Plato. And so there, there's an amount, there's a certain amount of fear there that Lewis identifies as, as one of the, the things that really keeps us from, kind of holds a lot of us back mm-hmm. from reading old books. I'm just going to read a little bit of what he says here because I think it will be helpful to kind of frame our conversation. The error is rather an amiable one, for it springs from humility. The student is half afraid to meet one of the great philosophers face to face. He feels himself inadequate and thinks he will not understand him. But if he only knew the great man just because of his greatness is much more intelligible than his modern commentator. Yeah, which that, is often true with oh, academia. Oh yeah, I I will say uh, just, just sort of jumping in a little little bit here, that that really resonated with me because I I also feel like okay I can't just read you know this great person this great person I need to read like some introductions to him, and that just gets me weighed down in like all this jargon and all this academic prose which is almost it's intelligible to like twelve people in the world, and and again it comes from that that fear like you said but I'll let you get back now the. And, and he points out that this preference for modern books and a shyness about old books is, he says, nowhere more rampant uh, than in theology. <laughs> and I, I certainly think that's true. I think it's become, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think that if you if you were to just kind of go out and tour church to church and see what just regular Christian people are reading, mm. you're probably not going to find a lot of reading groups, you know, dedicated to uh, Thomas Aquinas or Athanasius or Calvin, but instead, you know, a lot of books, a lot of kind of people reading and and talking about the kind of latest things. Mm. And Lewis says, I mean, and I think this is good to point out, like, he's like, hey, I'm a modern writer, (laughs) right? I mean, in his time, he is a modern writer, of course. And he says, 
I'm not saying that people shouldn't read modern books, mm-hmm. but I'm suggesting that that with our our sort of steady diet of reading modern writers, that we also, you know, maybe every other book or every three books. You know, he says if you can't handle every other book, try every <laughs> every third or fourth book. That you should season uh, your modern reading, your contemporary reading, with with something that has has proven to be durable and kind of stood the test of time in in some ways, uh, in a way that a lot of contemporary books haven't had the chance to do that yet. So, you know, he suggests a balanced diet. Let's call it that—a balanced diet for all of us, you know, Christian readers. That was another thing that really struck home because I, I know for me, I sometimes will look at all of the Christian books that get published and I just feel totally overwhelmed and inadequate too because like, is this good? Is this teaching something that is true? Is this, I, I think, uh, C.S. Lewis made this point, is like, are they making some sort of error in the implication of what they're saying that they don't even realize? And you can, I can even look back to books that especially Christian books that I read even like 10 years ago that were the new hot thing at the time. But even now, over that short time, they've been, they've sort of fallen by the wayside or like yeah. people have taken a step far and taking that step far shows that the argument is flawed and all these things. And that's not even getting into, if you take a step back further to like the, the blogosphere, I'm kind of part of the blogosphere, so I don't want to trash it completely, but that, <laughs> that gets to even more unsafe ground where it's like, for me as a dude that there's this sort of uh, women's blogger world and women's writer world where like people like Jen Hatmaker she made news a couple years ago I didn't know who she was but she's very important to a lot of people it's like all these yeah. things that are popular right now how do you evaluate it? and then C.S. Lewis would point us well don't just read now look, look back to things that people have fleshed out all the inadequacies and found it to still be valuable I think that it's hard to really even bring something like blogging into the conversation yeah. because, I mean, it's just, and, and I'm not hating on it. I, I enjoy reading blogs and, and news sites and all sorts of stuff. You can hate on them if um, you want. It won't hurt my feelings. No, I mean, I mean, but but it is just a different, I mean, it is such a, a different type of writing and it is so, it's very in the moment and there's just so much content and it's just, mm-hmm. it's just, come on, uh, isn't it's it really just like- hard. It's it's almost like pensies, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Blogging is yeah. just like it's like pensies, you know. That that was kind of wasn't that was Pascal was just going for. Oh, just okay. numbering. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I thought, yeah. I, I thought I okay. Like, so the the, the, the tea so the, the pensies. Of, no, no, no. I thought that's what you were talking about too. Was like, where's he going with this? No, like it's Pascal. like <laughs> oh, the yeah. ponce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A ponce. That's it. Yeah. See, <laughs> I was reading it. I didn't hear it hear it pronounced. All right. <laughs> it's almost like a blog, an ancient blog. So, yeah, yeah, you know, kind of a, a snippets, a, a stream of consciousness thing, or a commonplace book, like that kind of thing that people used to keep. The thing yeah. is that you just you used to not really publish those things as yeah. much, and 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 we just have a totally different kind of publishing platform now with the internet, and so it's hard to even compare things like that. So maybe, well, that'd be a great yeah. thing for you to compare there. Uh, yeah, be a great academic study. So, so I guess a couple oh, couple points there. First, if Pascal was alive today, he would be great at Twitter. Uh, Pascal <laughs> oh, yeah. is one of those writers who, what, what the life seems, I, I I admire him so much. I think he was just one of the most brilliant <laughs> minds that our civilization has produced. Um, I but, don't think that many people would appreciate his Twitter. It would it would probably <laughs> be very esoteric. Um, yes, and weird Catholic Twitter would be upset about him, but then weird Protestant Twitter wouldn't be too thrilled with him either, and he'd be yep. just kind of yep. off in the middle. Yeah. So uh, along those lines, we, we care about the thoughts of Pascal because, you know, he's, he's Pascal. Again, he's one of the most brilliant minds of the past millennium. But we now are in a world where Yahoo's like me can just give their thoughts, and that can be useful and helpful in some ways, hopefully. Uh, but it, it can be very prisoner of the moment where I have found even, again, my web presence isn't anywhere near what a lot of bigger people would be where like a little kerfuffle comes up in the culture and I feel obligated to weigh in with my two cents. It's like as if anyone asked for my two cents and lots of other people are doing it too and you get captured to that where it's like every single controversy becomes the thing you have to spend your time on and also 
you want to get people to read it, so you may be tempted to frame it in kind of a clickbaity, controversial way, even mm-hmm. though that's not the best thing either. So there are lots of things in today's world that make especially theological reading potentially dangerous. But mm-hmm. I, I think C.S. Lewis's point would be, even in a world that was blessedly without Twitter and blogging, that <laughs> just reading in one time period can be dangerous, period. It, that would be his argument, yep. right? Then? Yep. Yeah, so, so one of the ways that you can get past, or in su- not necessarily get past, but at least not get so totally caught up in whatever the controversy of the day is, is by also reading and immersing yourself in something from another time. Mm-hmm. Because we have our own blind spots, mm-hmm. um, we have our own things that we don't see, and especially when we're blinded by whatever the latest thing is, the latest controversy. And one of the ways that we can sort of gain a broader perspective and get out of whatever, it's impossible for us to fully get out of any of our cultural and the blind spots of our particular time, but we can at least broaden the perspective in a way by going back to the outlook of a different time. So here's what Lewis says. I'm just going to read here. Every age has its own outlook. It's especially good at seeing certain truths and especially liable to make certain mistakes. We all, therefore, need the books that will correct the characteristic mistakes of our own period. And that means the old books. And again, the old books aren't free from mistakes. Mm -hmm. I'm by no means suggesting that. And Lewis is not either. He, in fact, goes on to say, after that quote that I just cited, Hey, the past had its problems too. Mm -hmm. He says, there is not any magic about the past. People were no smarter then than they are now. They were just as prone to make mistakes as we do today. But they made different kinds of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And they were, maybe they tended to, because of education, personal experience, maybe they saw things. The things that they saw could be some of the things that we miss. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And, and I think it helps to sort of just make a comparison that, that a lot of historians make that I, I think is really helpful. And that's the quote that I've seen attributed to the historian David Lowenthal. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. Mm. Yeah. So we, I think all of us can understand that in other cultures and other countries around the world, that there is, there they have different ways of doing things. They often, they have different languages. They have different ways, uh, sometimes, of approaching problems and issues in, in different cultures. They have different intellectual traditions that they bring to the table, and we would all consider it to va- a value to encounter um, other cultures in that way and learn from them by traveling abroad and things like that, and and meeting people from other countries. I think, you know, pretty much. Most people would say, yeah, that's, that's a positive thing. And in the same way, by trying to encounter the past through reading old books, we can kind of encounter that foreign country that is the past. I am at risk of getting up on a personal soapbox here. So if I start <laughs> doing that, Mark's just pull me I'll off. pull you off, man. But I think something that we in our, our own particular time are particularly bad at is... I think we live in a very uh, morally certain and judgy time, which is kind of weird because when I was growing up, the problem was uh, moral relativism. And now that that's not thing. It's like we're we're all too we're all morally certain again. But it was in Christianity Today talking about how she was dealing with uh, sort of these secular graduate uh, programs or even more, you know, theological programs of a particular bent where they had this tendency to look back to the past like, oh, well, this guy was sexist, this guy was homophobic, this guy was racist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. True. Basically dismissing the past because, perhaps rightly, they, they determined that the past had these these flaws in it. And I, I think that is a tendency that all of us have, again, because I think we're kind of neo-Victorians that we, we really love to judge other people and that we think we all have it figured out, stepping off soapbox. So, like, how do we do that? Especially because some of these ancient texts do have these assumptions that it is legitimate to view as morally problematic. So do you think it's better to point those things out or do you want, do you think it's better to try to get within that mindset 
problems and all. Isn't it the idea when you're reading something from the past and what maybe helps us to frame it up is that when we read something old, we know we're going into it kind of as an anthropologist. Back to your favorite yeah. store. <laughs> Just kidding. But you're going back to it with, I need to understand these, um, I need to understand what's being written here with a broader, with a broader look. You know, I'm not, I can't be so judgy or I won't be able to apprehend what I'm reading. Whereas if it's a current writer, we have a harder time maybe being so open. It's like, what camp are you coming from? And um, Are you on my team or the other team? Yeah, and so maybe that's one of the things that reading the old dead guys and uh, old dead ladies, uh, what that does for us is that it, it does help us to step back and to say, okay, I'm probably not going to agree with everything here because I'm going to just gra- I'm gonna grapple with the culture. But then that helps us hopefully to look at each other too and to go, oh yeah, you're different from me too. You know, you, there's a reason why, Matt, you love to outline and that you have some of these freakish tendencies. Thank you. <laughs> and I can have My this. mom says I'm special. <laughs> well, God bless your mom. <laughs> but I, I don't know if that's one of, the, one of the ways that Lewis would say that it helps us. Um, I'm sure it was a pretty uh, divided time. When, when Lewis was writing, I mean, it was a time of war and everything else that's mm-hmm. going on. But he seemed to have a charity towards other people's points of view because he was so rooted in history. Right. I think that charity or I think, you know, historians, you know, nowadays, you know, use more the language of empathy. I think either term is is fine. It, that's one of the greatest benefits you can actually get from studying history and particularly from reading like primary sources in history. You can encounter people as people and if you sort of try to read in that empathetic way you don't have to forget about their patriarchal culture or whatever uh you know the problem is that we can look back and see um but you can certainly see this person as a person through their writing and see the beauty that they're able to bring you know i'm not i'm not just talking about theology books here because i'm I love reading, you know, ancient poetry and stuff like that, and and there's a beauty that that can kind of leap off the page as if it were newly written. That is striking. It's it's hard to put into words, but it it's something that that I think it just the key is the key is to encounter other people in the past with their their warts and all, eyes open about those things Mm. but with a level of understanding and empathy and charity towards them as as human beings and especially if you're talking about christian writers Mm. you know to catch those um the whiffs of what lewis in this essay calls like that familiar as the familiar scent or that familiar Mm. smell of christianity the odor which is death to us until we allow it to become life mm-hmm. the odor is is mere christianity it's that current of a kind of consistent and i don't even i don't want to say ideas as much as just and i think there's a reason why lewis is using kind of visceral um scent kind of tor- like uh sensational terminology there's just something that you can find in dante or in you know, uh, Bunyan or in Ephraim or Romanos that is a a flavor that is Christianity mm. and that's it's that kind of and you can gain that kind of ecumenicity uh, in time but it's this also kind of, this kind of sense of relatedness to people in the past as a Christian yeah. through, through that, you know, by encountering that but it's also a different flavor than our current flavor. <laughs> it makes us, I don't know, uh, you read something, uh, like I remember reading um, Ignatius of Loyola, you know, these letters that he had written to this noble woman, which is such mm-hmm. a different kind of situation than anything that, they're really pastoral letters, they're really 
beautifully put together, and there's situations that you can relate to, though you're, you're going, wow, this woman's life was very unique and very specific. And I just think that that's, I mean, for me, that was super helpful. And because it was this other person's dialogue, but then you were, I mean, it's devotions, right? Yeah. <laughs> and Lewis, when he, he writes that preface to Athanasia, and then Athanasius, because that was what he found to be the most valuable devotional stuff was mm. these old theological works, right? Right, 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 right. Yep. He's got that. He's got that great line in there about you know those of us who who might find that nothing happens when we sit down for with a with a book of devotions or you know sit down to pray may find that something. I'm paraphrasing when we you know are are reading a, a tough book of theology with a a pipe in our teeth and a pencil in our hand. <laughs> um, you get this great image of him, you know, with this pipe in his teeth and. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Actually, uh, shortly after I graduated, I was inspired, I think, by this line to smoke a pipe while reading through uh, Karl Barth's uh, Church Dogmatics. I did that <laughs> one, once or twice, and I had a wonderful time. Then the next day, my lungs felt a little burned, and I'm, I'm such a hypochondriac anyway. I, I shouldn't be a right. smoker. So like, I can feel the tar. The, the, the lung cancer, it's forming already, so I had to stop the that. Black lung, but pop. Yeah, I think I've got the black lung pop. But uh, the, the, the point underlying that is uh, absolutely valid. And, and also just going back to looking at the different flavors of uh, theology, I think that's a good tie-in to what we were talking about when we're encountering, you know, things that we would find, you know, objectionable or, or something in, in prior times. Like, a lot of these theologians had views that absolutely didn't mesh well. They had very serious differences, you know, like John Bunyan was a Puritan and kind of a prickly form of Puritan, I'd be like, oh, all you non-Puritans are definitely going to hell because you're not my type of Puritan. <laughs> but beyond that, like you said, there's absolutely that odor of mere Christianity that's recognizable even if you're in a different tradition. And there's things to be gleaned from the past that even if we encounter things like, oh, that was a huge moral blind spot that this time period had, there's still insights that that time period had too. There's still things to be gleaned from and I, I think another well, it also raises it also raises you know the question for yourself like yeah, exactly. what's my moral blind spot I mean mm -hmm. that's what I, I would I would recommend and I always try to remind myself when I, yeah. I have those kind of reactions is like what am I missing you yeah. know in yeah. myself uh, C.S. has actually had a good line in in, uh, in this uh, same piece where he says uh, quoting we may be sure that the characteristic blindness of the 20th century the blindness about which posterity will ask but how could they have thought that lies where we have never suspected it and concerns something about which there is untroubled agreement between Hitler and President Roosevelt or between H.G. Wells and Karl Barth. None of us can fully escape this blindness, but we shall certainly increase it and weaken our guard against it if we read only modern books. And I think that's mm -hmm. absolutely true. And I, I think that is a good reminder, like you said, Blake, whenever any of us, and I think we're all prone to this, get judgy about different people, different age, like just remember... People 100, 200 years from now will look back at something we believe. We probably have no idea what it is. They'll look back at something we believe and be like, how could those monsters have thought that? And it, sh it should be cause for humility on all of our parts. <laughs> right. Uh, which is, one of, again, one of the best benefits of, of reading old books. Absolutely. Just humility. Absolutely. So, so let's, let's take this in a slightly more personal direction, Blake. So we, we talked... If any of y'all listeners have not heard the St. Ephraim podcast, definitely go back and hear it. I, I thought it was super interesting. Lots of great stuff there. But how did you get into the world of old books? Because I, I happen to know you grew up in East Texas, probably Baptist. <laughs> so how That's did you right. get into the world of St. Ephraim and St. Athanasius and all the other fathers? Baptist is always a good guess when you're talking about <laughs> East Texas. So I went to college with you, Matt. And uh, that spoiler alert, there's some there's some friendly nepotism going on on this episode. And I think that sort of uh, as I as I received a, an education, um, a college education where I was doing I was a history major and I was doing a lot of reading of, uh, you know, one of the things that we really encourage history majors especially to do is to actually read um, snippets or uh 
you know, very often in undergrad, just selections from old, old works. Mm -hmm. And I just found that to be, you know, really, really interesting. I mean, as somebody who's always been, I've always been drawn to, to the broader world that history offers. I, there was never a time when I did not, I was not that way. So I was in that respect, I was never like, you know, a contented East Texas, sort of average East Texas boy to like just sort of live, you know, um, blithely in the present like that, you know, that was not me. And I and so it was kind of a natural turn for me to do start to do. I loved reading and I loved history. And so the combination of, of trying of reading things that were old was natural. But I, I won't say that I found it easy. I mean, so one thing that I always struggled with was poetry. I knew that I was supposed to like poetry, <laughs> right, as, a, as an aspiring cultured individual. But I, I, I just had such a hard time with it. And actually, I recently read Alan Jacobs' book, The The Pleasures of Reading in an Age of Distraction, yeah, yeah. although a modern book I would recommend to all the listeners. And one of the, he, he'd certainly, he points out how this is a, a tendency that a lot of us have is to feel that we have to read certain things out of a sense of obligation. Oh, yes. And so I would never, you know, it. so it actually took me, it took the experience of me kind of growing as a person and then eventually finding my way back to poetry before I actually felt that I, I really appreciated it. The thing that caught me was that to actually hear poetry that I thought was beautiful and compelling. Mm. And for me, that that first encounter was with Gerard Manley Hopkins. Yes. Um, probably around my senior year of college. And I was just struck by the beauty of the words and the images and kind of slowly from that began to let that interest bud a little more and so that that was a big part of it and then also uh, taking uh, church history classes and reading things like Athanasius and stuff like that was a part of it and and so I just I was just captivated by the idea of a bigger a bigger view of the world especially from a Christian a bigger view of Christian history and and the past that we have as tradition than I ever received in my upbringing so first Which of I, all, I have many things to say about my upbringing, but uh, you know, I, a big picture of yeah. the world uh, and and the current Christian history is not one of them. Yeah. So first of all, uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins is my favorite poet. Uh, full stop. So I was, I'm tempted to make this a whole Gerard Manley Hopkins episode after you said that, but wondering. <laughs> it would be a hard turn for us to make this late <laughs> in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, at the 36 minute mark. But uh, I was wondering because when, you know, I, I did something similar where I sort of find these older voices, uh, church history. The, uh, were there any particular church fathers or, you know, church church writers that uh, resonated with you? Well, I mean, um, Athanasius is on the Incarnation was yeah, one of the yeah. first that I read in, in its entirety. And it it is just, I mean, it's kind of... I guess a sort of summary of salvation history, mm -hmm. that's kind of the best way to think of it. And it tries to, I would say, answer a question sort of similar to that Anselm addresses. Why, why did God become human? Mm -hmm. What was the reason for uh, the incarnation? And what does the incarnation mean in itself? Which is something that I don't think I had ever thought about. Mm -hmm. There is, I think, in most flavors of evangelicalism a a focus on the death of Christ yeah. and his and his vicarious sacrifice and, and that kind of thing and I think it is so heavy a focus that most a lot of people you know go through their kind of day-to-day -day lives not not ever even thinking about the significance in and of itself of the idea that God became a human mm -hmm. uh, which is such a radical and and crazy unbelievable idea uh, that we find in the scriptures. So Athanasius just, you know, does a deep dive into yeah. it. And it is, but it's not too deep a dive. I, I, I don't want to scare the listener. Like it is a very accessible ancient book. It is theologically rich and not getting into the weeds in a way that people couldn't understand. So I think that's one of the, I think that's one of the great gifts of that particular book. Yeah, just sort of piling on uh, Athanasius, I, I, I think there are certain church fathers that if, if you were raised in sort of the evangelical world that you, you would particularly resonate with because they, they seem to have some sort of 
temperament, some sort of emphases that just really clicks with you. And I, I think Athanasius was definitely one of them for me as well. But first of all, just to give some more praise to, on, on the incarnation, it's it's really great because I read it also in college and I was able to understand it at, even though I was an English major and didn't really have any other backgrounds. It's just uh, C.S. Lewis gets to this too and is on the reading of old books where one of the aspects of the work's greatness is that you don't have to be an expert to understand it. And I, I really right. think that's right. true. And just some, some word, words on Athanasius himself. I love how his epitaph is Athanasius Contramundum, which means Athanasius mm -hmm. against the world. And I, I will say him as a saint is a source of inspiration for me when I get really <laughs> down on <laughs> just the state of the world in general. Uh, yep. I think you may just read what uh, C.S. Lewis had to say about Athanasius. Once again, he said his, ap his epitaph is Athanasius Contramundum, Athanasius against the world. We are proud, English, whatever, but uh, we, we are <laughs> proud that our own country has more than once stood against the world. Athanasius did the same. He stood for the Trinitarian doctrine, whole and undefiled, when it looked as if all the civilized world was slipping back from Christianity into the religion of Arius, into one of those sensible, synthetic religions which are strongly recommended today, and which, then as now, included among their devotees many highly cultivated clergymen. It is his glory that he did not move with the times. It is his reward that he now remains when, when those times, as all times do, have moved away. So, Athanasius, absolutely one for the evangelicals among us. Another one, I have found a lot of folks with an evangelical background really love St. John Chrysostom. And mm -hmm. I do as well. I think there's just something about his writing, his emphasis on the Bible, and kind of his curmudgeonliness in a good way that really oh, resonates yeah. with the evangelicals. Uh, if, if, well, not always in a good way, but... <laughs> not, always, not always in a good way. But uh, so. if, if y'all want to get a good introduction to him, uh, read his uh, Easter sermon, which I'm sure you can Google. Really great, oh, yes. uh, really great intro. Yep. I think I would emphasize to to those listeners who are like, well, you know, I'm, I'm not as much into reading theological texts. Find another old... Whatever it is, whatever your interest is that gives you pleasure and resonates with the things that you love, read those things. You know, don't don't feel the need to read certain books just to, mm -hmm. to mark them off a list um, that you think you need to make you be a, a good dinner party participant or whatever. Because yeah. um, I've been guilty of this, and, I, and I, I'm echoing Alan Jacobs' And I, what I think is his wisdom, which is to try to help people not fear reading books, um, is to encourage us to read the things that give us pleasure. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that would be, and for me, often that is a, a, a thing like on the Incarnation, which I love yeah. to read around Advent, you know, before Christmas. I, I try to read it every year. But, you know, there, it may be something else. You know, you may be a person who, who really loves poetry or really loves a good novel you know reading an old novel can be a chore sometimes but it can also be really rich you know for me you know Dostoevsky I love I love Dostoevsky it is a chore and I admit that the first time that I read the Brothers Karamazov I read it because I, I felt like it would I learned a lot from the wisdom of that book and have come back to it so yeah, you find the delight in it. Yeah, exactly. I think um, for me, it was uh, an organization called Renovare, uh, mm. Richard Foster and, yeah. and Dallas Willard. Yeah. A lot of the, the work, and they're still around doing this, but they were the ones who encouraged, and they used to have, I'm sure they still sell it, but it was a, a compilation called Devotional Classics. And Yeah, we used that in our... Uh, uh, Capstone class, I remember spiritual formation yeah. class, and it's oh, great because it's kind of a JBU. blend. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and so like I know for me, one of the books that, or yeah, it was Saint John of the Cross, um, mm. and the idea of the dark night of the soul because of my yeah. upbringing, it was like, what is this? Like, you're not supposed to have that, brother. You're just supposed to pray it out, and, you know, mm -hmm. um, do the do the thing, and you won't have that dark night of the soul. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Dark Night of the Soul is for is for an unbeliever or something, right? You know? Yeah, but it's been uh, the, it's been the experience of Christians for yeah. forever, and I was like, yes, oh, thank. I mean, it, it's not like yeah. a pleasant <laughs> read, you know, but it was it it saved me. It gave me like 
this other perspective of my faith that was not at all what I was being taught in church. Um, it, it had a richness to it that made me go, okay, well, I am a freak, but not in this way. <laughs> this is normal Christian experience. Yep. And I had a way to frame it up and to say, okay, God, lead me through this time. And th- th- I so am so thankful for that book. You know, so, sort of chime in here with some of the benefits I've found from reading older books. And uh, this first one is going to sound a little silly because I'll admit I have a weakness for Victorian and Edwardian like adventure pulp fiction. Uh, which is kind of a <laughs> weird niche, but I, I'm, I'm Hey, read what you love, man. But thank read you. Read what you love. Thank you. Uh, so I just recently uh, reread, because I, I love this book, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World. And uh-huh. there's plenty of problems we can find with it with modern people, uh, as modern people. But it's really interesting adventure story. One of the things that stuck out to me was uh, two of the main characters are these very pompous, very famous scientists who have this attitude like, well guys we figured everything out we're the smartest people who've ever who've ever lived and we have it all so congratulations to us and we're right and just looking at because uh, Sir Arthur tries to base it off of you know the science of his times this adventure story with dinosaurs so obviously it's up my alley and just seeing how even me a non-science expert would be like oh they were way off on that or no that yeah. we don't believe that at all anymore it's like oh even the smartest people who are the most pompous and the most sure of themselves can be super wrong in ways that are obvious to schmucks like me a century down the road. <laughs> so that, that's sort of a very tiny way that it's been helpful. And also, uh, sort of more fundamentally, I love when I read, especially an old poem or something like that, that really resonates with me all these centuries later. Like, when I really started loving literature. I remember the moment I was sitting in one of my high school English classes. We were going through old Anglo-Saxon poetry, and we came up mm. to this uh, one poem called The the Seafarer. And mm. it's about this, this old man who's been out on the sea for years, and he's miserable on the sea, but he's drawn to the sea and to the adventure. And it's just very human emotions that sort of yeah. stuck out to me, this sort of you know, pimple-faced 16-year-old in Colorado. And it, it was just a beautiful thing. And I, I, what, one in particular, I discovered uh, ancient Egyptian poetry. Like, we found these on, like, little fragments of, like, papyrus. They're, right. like, 3,000 years old. And they tell the story of human love, human relationships, in a way that really just resonates with me today. Like, there was this one poem. Oh, by the way shameless self-promotion. I wrote about this in The Late Great Humane Pursuit, so if you want to type in Love Am- Among the Pyramids Humane Pursuits, you can find me arguing this in print. But uh, <laughs> there's this one where the speaker of the poem is this young woman who's going off to meet with her friend and she bumps in on the way to this guy that she has a crush on and she like freaks out and embarrasses herself. It was like, wow, this is a woman who is a different gender different age, different race, lived on a different continent 3,000 years ago, but we kind of understand each other when it comes to being young and bumping into somebody you have a crush on. It was this really, (laughs) really amazing feeling to be like, all right, we have a connection here. (laughs) Right. So we're kind of running low on time, so maybe what we can do very quickly is if we could give some sort of recommendations, like some folks who want to start reading some older literature but want a good good launching off point so blake what what would you recommend oh you had to go with me first huh exactly i always try to put Uh, the guest on the spot (laughs) well i suppose it would it would depend on you know how old of a book they want to go with or and what kind of book it would be I think that any any listener who has not listened to, uh, or sorry, rather has not read Augustine's Confessions, for example, um, ought to do so. It's, I mean, really, before it, it it is a revolutionary book in in the history of of writing. There is no there is no kind of spiritual autobiography mm-hmm. of, of that sort prior in any ancient literature. That's one. That's one example where you really get into the, the heart of, uh, and and the kind of, 
felt emotions of the writer in a way that you really don't get in a lot of, of ancient works. That kind of thing wasn't valued in the same way that it is today. But Augustine just doesn't care. He just goes for it. And that kind of rawness of the confessions is one of the things that I think a lot of that makes it still like very accessible to modern mm -hmm. people. That kind of conversational nature of it with God as well is another thing that people find really appealing. And I do. Plus, when you I guess, read it, you, you kind of trip over the, these stories that you've heard and you're like, oh. And yeah. Uh, yeah. You're like, oh, that's where that line came from. Yeah. I like the pear, the pear tree. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's just fun yeah. to read the whole thing. Oh, this is this is where that came from, and yeah, his conversion. Right. You know, I've you, yeah. you've read about that, but to actually read his telling of it, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so and, even, and even at the end where he goes into these like these kind of what strike many modern readers is this weird, unnecessary like meditations on the nature of time and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, like, like, where is this coming from? I mean, he's thinking, you know, if you think about it, try to get a taste of where he's coming from. It's, he's, this whole book is kind of a meditation and he's sort of, in light of everything he's just said, he's kind of reflecting on like, well, what is, what is time and what is memory? And that's real deep. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a really, um, a kind of potentially very, if you're open to it, a very thought provoking place to go for all of us as we think back on our own memories and our own and the kind of the way that time has shaped us. So that, that would be one that I would recommend. Another just short shout out, one that I thought of from, again, from, you know, early Christianity would be um, Gregory the Great, Book of Pastoral Rule or, the, or Pastoral Care, depending on what the title is that you find. There's a wonderful translation of this in the popular patristic series. And it is, I think, one of the most pastoral and kind of ministry focused books uh, from the early church and it's it's just really a really lovely and interesting and you know still very relevant and challenging book so great to see Gregory the Great one of greatest theologians in the church being pastoral too yeah it is it's a reminder that, that all that a lot of these guys who we, you sort of think of as as sort of just sitting I guess like in some room writing constantly we're also yep. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, living regular lives. I mean, especially you encounter this when you read their sermons. Mm -hmm. Well, but um, that, that's also, I mean, it's also a brilliant thing about the, the ancient guys is that it's more of a modern thing where theology was co-opted by the university. Mm -hmm. I mean, right, right. most of the theologians historically were pastors mm -hmm. and doing pastoral work within a certain context and community. And I mean... Martin Luther was certainly that way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, he was he was working with a, a parish, and uh, yeah, Augustine. And you can say the hippo. same thing. Yep, exactly. Yeah. He's in hippo, right, doing his work. You can say the same thing about a lot of uh, the philosophers right. and poets. Other, you know, they're they're um, they're not just sort of in an ivory tower as we think of it, but they're living in maybe a monastic life or in a doing in ministry in a local parish or whatever so all right so marcus your, your recommendation um yeah so uh saint john of the cross uh the dark night of the soul is not an easy read but it's it's uh it's something to grapple with and then um i think it's just called devotions but it's saint ignatius of loyola isn't that it um it was a collection of his but it was it's just fantastic. and The spiritual exercises? Spiritual that exercises, that must be it. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's the letters that he had written to this noble woman. She's writing for spiritual guidance, and he writes these letters back to her. And, uh, mm. yeah, it's, it, that's a, it's really pastoral. It's really, he is trying to help her to preserve her Catholic faith in the midst of court. <laughs> and uh, mm. it, it's a really great work. All right, so I'm I'm gonna go slightly more pagan with my recommendations, but uh, I I think that's all right. <laughs> so uh, first of all, gonna go uh, Anglo-Saxon, uh, like I already said, the Seafarer, and uh, there's another one similar themes called the Wanderer. Those are both uh, shorter poems, they're sort of good uh, to sort of dip uh, dip your toe in the water. If you want to get slightly more ambitious, go with uh, Beowulf. I would recommend the Seamus Haney translation. Uh, it's yes. not as literal, but it, it keeps the poetic form, which is way more important than getting the, the exact uh, words correct. And uh, this personal anecdote, I read it to my uh, oldest when he was two years old, 
kind of as Whoa. a joke, and he actually liked it, and we read like a fourth of it before we stopped. So <laughs> there you go, two year old approved. And uh, finally, quick shout out if you want to go with uh, something like the Aeneid. This is controversial among some of the sticklers. I've heard the Robert Fagel's translation uh, denigrated as uh, way too loose and not too literal. But to those oh, I people, like it, though. he brings the thunder. Here's the opening line of the Aeneid. <laughs> rage. Goddess, sing the rage of Peleus' son Achilles. Murderous, doomed, that cost the Achaeans countless losses. Hurling down to the house of death so many sturdy souls. Great fighter souls, but made their bodies carrion, feast for the dogs and birds, and the will of Zeus was moving toward its end. Begin muse when the two first broken clashed Agamemnon, but then he keeps going. Come on. He starts it with rage. You have to read yep. it. And then, and then bam, opening credits. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I just have to say, like, when you're talking about poetry like this, like pre-modern poetry, you got to read it out loud. Yes. You know, especially these epic poems. They're made to be heard. They're made to be spoken out loud. And so, like, don't be afraid to, to read them out loud, and you might actually appreciate them better. That's yes. and if given my the, two cents about that. And if given the choice yeah, of keeping one that gets it literally correct or one that tries to mimic the poetic form, absolutely go for one that mimics the poetic form. Because that's, that's most closer, that, that, to me at least, that's uh, closer to what the original <laughs> intent would have been. Feels. Yes. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, Blake, thank you again for joining us at the pub table. And... Uh, Yes, had a lot of good recommendations here, and maybe I'll see you at the JBU reunion coming up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Thanks, guys. It's going to be the 10-year right. anniversary. We're so getting I'll old. Close uh, anyway. with, the, with the Anselm quote here. Yes. So um, this is Anselm's most famous quote, but uh, we'll just lay it out here again. For I do not seek to understand in order to believe, but I believe in order to understand. For I believe this... Unless I believe, I will not understand. So until next time, cheers. Cheers.